The next speaker is Dr. Jean-Pierre Charles Revol of Switzerland. He holds a mechanical engineer degree, a license of mathematics, and a PhD in particle physics. Dr. Jean-Pierre is one of the founding members of the International Thorium Energy Committee, and he became its first president in 2012. Dr. Jean-Pierre believes that thorium must be a part of a successful energetic future for our civilization, as it is a source of energy es essentially sustainable on human time scales, and can be used in accelerator-driven systems to produce abundant, safe, and clean energy, as well as to destroy nuclear waste. He will speak to us on the International Thorium Energy Committee strategy. I realize that I have a small problem. My talk was moved from a parallel session to plenary, and I just noticed that actually the time slot is only 20 minutes, and I had uh, assumed that it was 30 minutes. So I hope you can give me a little bit more time. Oh. If not, I will uh, have to, uh, to uh, shorten a little bit what I wanted to say. Okay. I would like to, uh, of course, talk about uh, iTech. Uh, it's, uh, it's motivation. Uh, this thing doesn't work very well. Maybe it works like now. No, no it doesn't. Uh, on the other side. Boost again a little bit, and uh, I would like to explain why we're interested in uh, in thorium, why we think ADS is an efficient way of using thorium, and uh, I will also describe what can be done today with ADS systems and what should be done, and then I will conclude on a small announcement of what uh, iTech is going to do. So. Essentially, within a century or, uh, or hopefully sooner, humankind will have to move from an economy entirely based on fossil fuel to a fossil fuel-free economy for two main reasons. One is that fossil fuel reserves are finite, and the other is that the impact of fossil fuel burning on the environment is becoming unbearable. Here you see the energy consumption as a function of time. Today the world uh, behaves like a big engine with a fantastic power of 15 terawatt. It's a big number, but if you scale it by the number of people on the planet, it's only two kilowatt per, per capita. And the total energy consumption tends to increase at a rate of about 2% per year. And you can see that this energy is totally dominated by fossil fuels. Uh, they uh, have uh, of the order of 85 to, to 90 percent uh, of the share. And if you divide reserves by production rate, you immediately see that the, uh, the time scale is not uh, centuries, it's uh, tens of years. I mean, it's about uh, 50 years for oil and gas and uh, of the order of 100 years for coal. So people will tell you, yeah, but those numbers have been uh, stable in time for a long time. In fact, this is not true for coal. In the past, uh, in the past 10 years, the number came down by uh, a factor two because uh, coal uh, consumption is increasing strongly. Now we have to realize that uh, if people of the world, of, of developing countries, uh, are allowed to live as well as people live, for instance, in Europe, and Europe is doing relatively well compared, for example, uh, uh, to the United States, your, your European citizen uses about 50% of the energy a U.S. citizen uses, then the energy consumption of the world will have to increase by at least a factor three that takes into account uh, population increase and so forth. And in fact, I put the reference here of a fantastic lecture on population growth uh, by, uh, uh, by a Swedish uh, professor uh, and I invite you to, to look at it on the web. It's uh, really a fantastic uh, lecture that makes you feel more, much more intelligent after you've uh, heard the lecture because you understand what's happening to, to world population. So does it make sense to burn fossil fuel uh, till the end? First of all, you have global warming. We heard yesterday by uh, Anil Kakotkar telling us that uh, not only is the uh, temperature uh, probably uh, 
going to exceed uh, two degrees at the end of the century, but maybe it will be three degrees, four degrees. And I remind you that uh, the last ice age was only eight to nine degrees uh, uh, colder than what we have today. So uh, four uh, of the other four degrees is really significant. Uh, the fact is that uh, CO2 has been increasing at a rate which is unprecedented, at least for, for, for the past million years, and it's very difficult to, to predict what the, uh, in, uh, the consequences will be. Uh, nevertheless, most people believe that uh, we are in trouble, and, uh, and uh, I think if you don't believe that we are in trouble uh, because of global warming, then the precautionary principle tells you that in any case you should, uh, you should do something. But if you're not worried about global warming, then you should really be worried about air pollution because this is with us today. And uh, WHO estimates that one death in eight in the world is due to uh, air pollution. Uh, burning coal uh, induces uh, of the order 43 billion euros of, of uh, healthcare uh, expenses in Europe and uh, this number is going closer to 50 billion today. And uh, just to give you an idea, in 2013, 400,000 Chinese citizens died of air pollution. So I'm even wondering why air pollution is not the main motivation to go away from fossil fuels. And in fact, you can see uh, the, the photo on the right here. Uh, this was in Paris in, in the spring, and that was when the wind blows from Germany, where they, where, where they have all those uh, coal-fired power plants, and it starts looking like Beijing. So, the the problem is that the current uh, the the current tendency is uh, to increase the usage of fossil fuel, and uh, what is the way out? In my view, the way out is innovation. But innovation requires both investment in fundamental research and in systematic R&D. And uh, this is a difficult thing to, to obtain, as you all know here, when you're struggling with funding to do something about thorium. However, there is in principle no lack of <coughs> funding. Perhaps there is a lack of visions from our politicians. Uh, according to Bloomberg, uh, New Energy uh, Finance, uh, between 2005 and 2013, Europe spent 600 billion euros on renewable energy. Can you imagine? They, this is, I, I, I come from CERN, this is 750 years of the budget of CERN. And, and when you think that MIRA is not founded and MIRA is only 1 billion euro, you could imagine that maybe uh, giving only 599 billion euros to renewable energy and 1 billion to MIRA would have been uh, 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 a good thing to do. Uh, obviously, the other sources of energy do not uh, receive such colossal investment. And if you take the world into account, it's about five times the amount that is spent in Europe. And obviously, all this money doesn't go to R&D. Otherwise, we would be in much uh, better shape. So innovation is precisely what iTech is about. Promote in, in, innovation, more specifically in the development of thorium technology. iTech is a relatively young international association which is situated in Geneva. Uh, it has members that come from the scientific communities. Uh, we have engineers from industry, and we have also a number of local politicians, and there is a rather strong CERN base uh, because uh, a number of us are either at CERN or retired from CERN. I give you a few dates um, concerning ITEC. The, the, uh, ITEC was created in the end of 2012. And the first thing we did, we tried to organize the a conference and we did organize TEC 13 in, uh, in 2013 at CERN. And then in the spring of this year, we signed an MOU with a company called iBell, which is uh, our first industrial partner. And in October of this year, we uh, took a first concrete step toward uh, the exploitation of thorium, and I will tell you uh, more about that later. So Tech 13 at CERN was a, a big success. I remind you that you still have all the talks on the web. They're all published. All the main world actors were present. We had 32 countries. And I'm sure that Tech 15 
is well on the way to uh, be another remarkable event in the in the uh, history of, of Thorium. And uh, of course, that conference at CERN was attended by a number of pres prestigious uh, participants. We had Hans Blix from uh, IAEA. Uh, we had an ex-president of the Swiss Confederation. We had two Nobel Prize winners, and one of them was Carlo Rubia, the inventor of the energy amplifier. By the way, the, the proceedings are just about to, to come out. It, it took two years, and I, my advice to take 15th organizers, if you want proceedings, don't underestimate the effort it takes to get all the contributions from the participants. So it will be uh, published by Springer, and it's a matter of, of a few weeks now to, to get them out. So why thorium? Uh, I think uh, Carlo Rubia summarized that very simply. Thorium is a sustainable source of energy on a human time scale. You could run this 15 terawatt of, of power of the civilization uh, for 20,000 years if you only use one part per million of the thorium in the Earth's crust. So there is plenty of thorium. Of course, uh, this works because we, we want to use thorium in the uh, breeding mode, which you can also do with uranium, but unfortunately, with uranium, things are not as nice as with thorium. You already know everything about the breeding, so I will not go into uh, details, but the fact is that if you combine the uh, higher abundance of thorium in the earth crust with the fact that we use breeding, then you're talking about a factor about 500 in the uh, resource compared to, to thorium uh, 235 used in uh, PWR. And the two breeding uh, chains are quite similar with a very uh, in interesting difference. It's the lifetime of protactinium, which is about 10 times uh, larger than the lifetime of, of uh, neptunium, and that has very interesting consequences in the way you, you uh, operate the, the systems. I mean, the, one of the other main advantages of thorium is the fact that it reduces very uh, drastically the production of waste, and you can uh, see that uh, very easily on, on these slides because you can uh, notice immediately. Oh, wait. That's a bit fast. It, it takes. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay, never mind, uh, this thing doesn't work. Uh, it takes seven neutron capture to go from uh, thorium to plutonium 239, so you can immediately see that uh, it's harder to produce the TRUs. And if you, um, if you combine efficient recycling with the fast neutron flux, in fact, you can get the TRU content to become as small as you, as you wish, and this is a great advantage of thorium. Now, since you want to do breeding, it's interesting to compare the breeding capability of uranium-233 compared to plutonium-239. Here, uh, on the vertical axis, you have uh, uh, something that uh, is essentially the excess of neutrons that you can use for breeding. So when epsilon is larger than zero, you can do breeding. And you see that uranium-233 is better than plutonium at, in the thermal domain. Unfortunately, we want to use it in the fast neutron uh, domain where the um, where unfortunately U233 is not doing as well as plutonium and this is the reason why uh, you have to do uh, something special if you want to to use uh, uh, thorium uh, basically for various reasons of neutronics you cannot simply replace the uh, fuel uh, the uranium fuel in a PWR with uh, with thorium fuel that would be too simple so what you, what you can do is three, uh, three options. One is thorium blanket around uh, fast critical reactors, and this is the Indian uh, solution, the Indian approach. It's the most advanced approach to using thorium. It's a bit complicated because you have to maintain three technologies of, of uh, nuclear reactors, but it works. So this is really uh, a good option. Then you can recirculate the, the fuel, either in pebble bed type of, of uh, reactors or in molten salt reactors. I will not uh, discuss uh, these today. But the third option we are interested in is to provide the extra neutrons with an accelerator, and that's the accelerator-driven system. So it consists in, 
in uh, uh, producing neutron by spallation in, in, uh, on a target which is uh, in the middle of, of a core and you have two types of, of neutron production. You have spallation neutrons which uh, tend to have a relatively high uh, energy spectrum and you have fission neutrons and the, the difference in the tail of the energy spectrum of neutrons actually brings very interesting features to, to the ADS which I don't have time to, to, to discuss but which are quite uh, interesting and this is related to the fact that there is neutron multiplication in the tail enhanced by the NXN uh, reactions. So the idea is not only to use thorium, but to, to combine thorium with passive uh, processes, both for heat removal and, and for safety in general, to, to provide a system which is intrinsically safe. The advantage of ADS is that it consists mainly in rearranging existing technologies, and uh, it can be complementary to various scenarios in a ser scenario where you run UPU system then the ADS could uh, provide the minor actinide burner or in a scenario where you, you want to, to burn TR, uh, TRU with thorium then what you are actually doing is converting TRU into U233 so uh, you can uh, also use ADS to produce U233. The fact that there is an accelerator allows a lot of flexibility in the way you run the system and in particular it allows you to modulate the power output and, and uh, this in fact could be uh, uh, also um, a way to enhance the production uh, of uh, renewable energy because uh, then uh, ADS would uh, produce the energy when there is no sun or uh, no wind. The physics of ADS is very well known. There are some pioneering experiments that uh, verify that all the concepts are, are okay. That was done at CERN with the FIT and the TARC experiments. W today we have a beam, a proton beams that have exceeded one megawatt of power. That's uh, here a photo of the uh, cyclotron at PSI. And uh, you can see that um, one of the issues with the accelerator, especially if you use solid fuel, is uh, fatigue of the fuel if you have interruption of the beam. And this is an area where R&D has to be done if you want to go to a high power system. And uh, there are already uh, proposals on the way to um, improve significantly the reliability of the uh, accelerator and here is a design of the cyclotron by uh, Pierre Mandrillon from IMA where he has enough room to have three uh, sources and uh, this uh, imp increases by a tremendous amount the, uh, uh, the uh, reliability of the system. So there is very good prospect to, to get a beam that can do what, what we want. There is also uh, experience in uh, neutron spallation uh, sources. At PSI, uh, the Megapide was the first uh, megawatt uh, spallation source. It ran for three months without any problem, and then the, the, the project was terminated because uh, Switzerland is not so much interested in, in ADS. And you have today the uh, spallation neutron source in the US we, which ran with the power of up to 1.4 megawatts. So we have today both uh, uh, proton beams and uh, spallation uh, sources in the uh, range of 1 to 2 megawatt. And uh, of course one day uh, you want to, to go to perhaps 10 megawatt to have a system like uh, for example this uh, design by Acker Solution which uh, uh, is coming from the uh, idea of the energy amplifier with Rubia. However, before you can go to, to, to a gigawatt of power, you have to, to do a little bit of R&D and, and do demonstrators. There's been a lot of uh, ADS projects. However, all those which have been um, uh, realized so far were realized at uh, zero power. And I think the, the next step in the field is to have a first prototype of significant power. I highlighted three items here. The first one is fit because it was the first uh, coupling at um, essentially zero power. It was one watt, but it was sufficient to, to verify all the physics. There is Mira, which uh, I already mentioned, which is under design and unfortunately not uh, funded yet, even though, as I, I showed, there is uh, money in the system. 
And there is a very interesting situation at Troisk, it's near Moscow in Russia, because there is a facility that already has a beam and a spallation target, and uh, it is the uh, project in which ITEC is interested. What can be done today if you take a beam um, uh, of the power of Mira or uh, SNS, you can see that you can uh, easily have an ADS today with a power of 100 to 200 megawatt or even uh, more, depending on the value of the effective uh, neutron multiplication coefficient you're, you're prepared to you're prepared to use. So you see here on the vertical axis the thermal power as a function. Of, of K, the multiplication factor, and the curves that you see are curves of constant uh, power. So the top one is the one that corresponds to the energy amplifier of Rubia. You see with a K of 0.98, you get, uh, you need about uh, 12 megawatt of power. However, you, you can see that uh, with Mira, you, with, a, uh, with a range of K, which is quite reasonable, you can easily get to uh, 100 or 200 um, uh, megawatt and at Troisk uh, with uh, beam power which is of the order of 50 kilowatts so between 25 and 75 kilowatt or perhaps even 100 kilowatt you can uh, reach a power which is in the megawatt and the megawatt is the minimum power that you need to really uh, test um, uh, an industrial system and learn how to operate an ADS. So a demonstrator of significant power is nece a necessary step, and the strategy of ITEC is to contribute to, uh, to, uh, to a system that builds on an existing facility. The accelerator exists, the uh, beam energy is 250 to 300 MeV, it can be pushed to 550, uh, 25 to 75 kilowatt of beam power. The spallation source exists, I mean the one uh, is actually in operation, it's producing uh, medical isotopes. And there is a design of the core which needs to be optimized. So the cost estimate of this is about 5% of the cost of Mira, and the project can be completed in five years. So here is the LINAC. You can see it's a spectacular object. There is a target area. You can see both the, the sketch of the, of the target and the photo taken uh, Near the, the, near the place where the ADS uh, will be installed. And uh, the strategy of ITEC consists in uh, now discussing with the various partners in Russia. Here is a meeting with the president of the Russian Academy of Sciences. There is now somebody in the academy in charge of thorium, so this is a very good, good, uh, uh, good, good thing. Uh, the first uh, stage was an evaluation of the uh, capability of the facility, which has been completed using uh, a beam specialists from CERN. And uh, now, um, and in fact last week, ITEC decided to go to the next phase, which is to complete a feasibility study, a detailed feasibility study. So conclusion. Thorium should play a major role in future energy production because it is a sustainable energy source on a human time scale. ADS with a fast neutron flux is the most efficient way of using thorium that can be complemented, that can complement other nuclear scenarios. With existing accelerators and neutron spallation source technologies, it is already possible today to build modular energy sources of the order of 100 to 200 megawatt, even a bit higher if you allow the uh, K value to, to approach uh, one. ITEC has decided to invest in a feasibility study for Troisk, uh, a first demonstrator of significant thermal power which is a necessary step to, uh, to imagine uh, industrial uh, phase for ADS. And this should be faster and cheaper than current project. The community is welcome to, to join that. And I will give you more details on this in the talk I will give tomorrow in the uh, parallel session. Thank you. The floor is open for questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, in one of the slides, you have mentioned that uh, putting thorium in the blanket of fast reactor is the most advanced uh, Indian uh, approach. But at the same time, you said, but it, sh it should work. 
What are your concerns on that one? Well, I, maybe I should not say it should work. As I think it's based on three technologies that work. So we know it will work if it's implemented as described. You are not concerned on that? No. I'm uh, maybe concerned about the fact that the way it you are written it shows that it's a concern. It, it implies uh, maintaining three different technologies, but clearly each of them works. So there is no, uh, there is clearly no. In the, the in this uh, concept that you think it is, your uh, accelerator is uh, available to you, right? Sorry, the accelerator is available to you. Yes. The cost of that is not included in the whole economics. Sorry, can you repeat this? Cost, cost of the accelerator yes. is not part of the project then. I've, sh I've shown that you have accelerators that exist today with a, uh, already a power of 1 to 2 megawatt and, uh, and there are ideas to, uh, to go beyond that. So what is your question about the accelerator? The, are you including the cost of the accelerator in the... In the cost of the accelerator? Yes, I mean... You see, it's very difficult to, to discuss the cost of a project before you even have a prototype that exists. Uh, people believe that the cost should not exceed 30% uh, of, the, of the cost of the, of the whole system, but uh, you know, I would refrain from discussing cost uh, before uh, we know exactly how the system will be done. It's like uh, in, in fusion today, so you people will ca are calculating the cost of the uh, electricity that uh, will be produced by fusion. For me, the cost is infinite because there is no such system. So the same applies to any new things that has not yet been built. But there is no reason to believe that the cost of the accelerator would be such that it would prevent the system from being cost effective. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to rather uh, thank for the yesterday's uh, your comment uh, after one particular speaker when he mentioned about uh, India and China are a major uh, contributor of uh, emissions. And you answered very well aptly that uh, it was uh, more of a per capita population. Uh, yesterday, uh, could you recall that uh, yesterday there was one of the speakers who mentioned about uh, India and China are the major contributor of uh, CO2 emissions. And thereafter, you had uh, immediately commented on it. That it was not that because of uh, the reason. It was mainly because of uh, per capita population, which contributes to. Uh, so therefore, we should look into that angle. So it is rather I would like to thank uh, you that on behalf of uh, I would say rather Indian and Chinese uh, subcontinent that uh, that was a rapt answer. Of course, we do. Uh, government has to regularize that part of it, and uh, government norms and other. Uh, norms from the authorities and industrial revolution has to come in that way. We do promote in that, that uh, yes, of course, one has to look into the CO2 emissions and it should be as low as possible. So it is just a thanksgiving to you rather. Yeah, well, thank you for your comment. In fact, I can add one thing. I, I regret not to see here a representative of, of DOE or French CA and all those people who have developed the most advanced nuclear technologies and who should be here joining forces with India and China to to try to innovate in the nuclear domain. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Could you show me the, your slide, page 12? 12. 12. 12. This one. Yes. You showed the entry door to nuclear waste production at uranium-238. Yes. So you explained, so this is far away from thorium. Yes. So, but uh, this is not the, you know, the neighbor nuclides with thorium-232 are also nuclear waste if yes. you dispose it. So the, the, you should write uh, entry to the TRU. I, uh, I agree. Yeah, well, what I meant by nuclear waste is the, the waste that we're dealing with today, of course. Uh, no, it's, it's not wrong definition, I think. If you dispose thorium waste near the thorium-232, it shows similar long radio, radiotoxicity. So it's nuclear waste, even around the thorium. 
So yes. the entry to the TRU, yeah. I agree. But uh, this is true, uh, but with the one little difference is that uh, if, you, if you recycle, I mean, this waste is no longer waste, it becomes fuel. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's also a matter of definition yeah. whether you call it waste or fuel. I mean, TRU could be fuel for ADS to generate U233, for example. So, so TRUs are, are not waste if they are recycled. Yeah, it's a matter of semantics, I mean, uh, but yeah. if you yeah. like to change the definition, it's fine with me. We, I think we understand what we're talking about. You understand. But uh, I, I'd like to say this slide leads misunderstanding, if especially to the public. Yeah, you, you know, I, wanted, I had written existing waste, <laughs> but <laughs> I think, uh, of course, if it exists, because otherwise we would not try to destroy it. And I, I found it a little bit silly to talk about existing waste or present waste. Thank you for the comment and clarification. Is there one more question? Okay, I don't, don't there's one. Uh, Rao from the U.S. Uh, I find your presentation extremely optimistic and based on, trust me, we'll make it cheaper. Well, if uh, you're not optimistic, you do me, anything. Huh? <laughs> uh, there is, ultimately, for it to be useful as an energy source, it has to be economical. Uh, and, of course, I don't see anything here which says it would be economical compared to any of the other sources. Uh, I don't the see anything second thing, to the contrary. Let me, let me finish the question. The question, uh, I have two questions. It doesn't say how long research you need to do this. The global warming will have happened long before you finish your funding for MIRA. Uh, and uh, how do you expect it to compare economically with the options that might be available down the road? Well, uh, you know, uh, I want to, to say again that, uh, of course, in the end, uh, energy source should be economical. But uh, until it's developed, you don't know exactly how much it's going to cost. But clearly, it has to be optimized in such a way that it becomes competitive at one point. But if you um, put the economic constraints as your first requirement, then you will not do any, anything new because there is never a guarantee that when you do something new, uh, it will be economically competitive. And in fact, uh, what I wanted to say is that I'm not pretending that uh, uh, thorium or, or ADS uh, by itself will, will be the key to uh, the energy uh, problem. What will be the key to the energy problem is to do systematic R&D and the best solutions will emerge naturally. And uh, uh, I believe that ADS has a good chance to become competitive. But again, until a system like this has been built, we cannot tell. And the same applies to molten salt uh, systems or, or other, other systems that have not yet uh, been. Uh, well, molten salt, there, there's been one already, but uh, you know, they have not been built on in, uh, an industrial scale. So yes, uh, competitiveness is, is important, but you cannot s put this as the first requirement because at one point, uh, you know, if we continue burning all the coal of the world, the question will not be competitiveness. The question will be, do we want to keep uh, people of the, uh, of the planet alive? And if, even if that has a cost, uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be ready to pay a little bit more for uh, their electric power to go away from fossil fuels. Thank you, Dr. Ravo. The organizing committee would like to give you a memento and appreciation of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>